All right, well, it is the top of the hour. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NAGT webinar. The NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NIGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join in on the discussion. Uh, on the screen is a link to the webinar series, uh, as well as in the chat box, where you can find the webinar schedule and an archive of past events and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can find slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. And I'll add that link, as well as a few others, to the chat again. Before we get started, please take a moment to review the Zoom controls on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and cameras off during the webinar. If you have questions and comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box. To find the chat box, uh, find the Zoom control bar and either click on chat or the more button, which will lead you to the chat. Webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring the chat box. Finally, a reminder that participants in NAGT meetings and events are expected to abide by the NAGT code of conduct, which applies in all venues, events, and online forums associated with NAGT. Please read the full NAGT code of conduct policy, which I've linked to in the chat for any details. Uh, now I'm gonna turn things over to Aida Farrow, who will introduce our speakers for today. Thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen. So uh, thank you all for joining us. This is a very exciting event. Um, this is our second webinar in the NAGT quasi joint webinar series and the webinar is focused on uh, quasi services for water education community. And um, I've put the webinar description here. I'm not going to go through it, but I've just uh, bolded a, a couple of like key sentences in the description. First of all, if you are not familiar with QUASI, QUASI is the consortium of universities uh, for the advancement of hydrologic sciences. And um, the uh, wonderful uh, ho uh, speakers today uh, will be talking about uh, QUASI data and um, services basically. Uh, for discovering, sharing, and archiving publishing water-related data, and enabling reproducible workflows and codes sharing through Jupyter Notebooks. I've heard a lot about Jupyter Notebooks, and I cannot wait to learn more about it. And um, obviously, Quasi supports education and outreach to the community, and we are very happy that we are working with them to provide us uh, resources that we can work with them in outreach. And then uh, one of the wonderful quasi members uh, will tell us about her use of quasi resources to um, provide this example for everyone so uh, we can all learn from her experience and um, use um, quasi resources in the future. So without any uh, further ado, our, uh, I'll do a quick introduction of the speakers. Dr. Jared Bales, Bales, who is the Quasi Executive Director, will start. And after that, Dr. Ann Jefferson, who is an associate professor in the Department of Geology at Kent State and a member of the Board of Directors at Quasi will also provide um, uh, or we'll uh, uh, continue the webinar. We will after that have a discussion uh, and potentially we will uh, uh, break into breakout rooms to cover some of the uh, ways that NAGT and Quasi can combine resources to help faculty in using these, the resources that Quasi provides. So I am going to stop sharing my screen at this point and pass it on to Jared. Hi, well, thank you so much. Let me uh, get my things going here. There we go. So uh, this image I really like. It kind of <laughs> it, sh it shows what we all 
experienced back in March, right? Classrooms sort of went dark and it pushed us all into uh, sort of a new world of, of education. Quasi, um, like, I mean, not unlike geology, we're a, we're a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary field, really. I mean, uh, certainly geology uh, teachers teach hydrology and hydrology teachers uh, have to teach geology. And so this motivates this interdisciplinarity of, of hydrology and water science motivates a lot of what uh, we do at Kawasi. And we're just so pleased to be uh, working with NAGT. So what is Kawasi? Well, so sometimes people kind of, our, our acronym is not intuitive, and, but here's the uh, phonetic uh, spelling of it. But we're a nonprofit consortium. Um, our members are institutions and not uh, individuals. Uh, and so we have about 130 uh, institutions that are members of Kawasi. Um, our mission is to advance water science. Uh, and we do this in a number of ways. Uh, the primary ways are through what we call community services and data and model services. And so I'll talk about each of these uh, in turn. So the first thing to know about Kawasi is that we're committed to growing diversity, equity, and inclusion in our community. Um, we have um, uh, this year in February, we, we published a DEI strategic plan. We're currently working on an implementation plan that builds off of that strategic plan. And we invite you to join us uh, as we uh, develop this implementation plan. We certainly want uh, input from the broad, as broad a community as we can. Quasi also published a, a Black Lives Matter statement earlier this summer. Uh, and uh, all of this information is on our uh, DEI website, which is posted there at the bottom of the slide. Currently, uh, quasi-member uh, institutions are limited to uh, universities with graduate programs in some aspect of, of water science, whether it's engineering or geology or hydrology or atmospheric sciences or whatever. So our, uh, our board has uh, gone on record in, and in support of our DEI strategic plan of broadening quasi membership to any academic institution and nonprofit institution. So uh, we are proposing a change to our bylaws that will allow full membership uh, to academic institutions that are uh, primarily undergraduate serving institutions. We believe this is a way uh, to uh, grow diversity and equity in our community and we believe that Quasi services uh, in particular can benefit some of the smaller schools where resources may be limited. So our membership will be voting on a bylaws change uh, in the next few months and we're hopeful for a positive outcome on this. So Quasi offers funding opportunities for students uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, we, we have grants, we have uh, travel support, and uh, for meetings and for workshops, we have competitions uh, in which students can participate. So we have, we have for example, the Pathfinder Fellowship, which uh, allows students to go uh, do research at a particular site for a short term. We have something called Instrumentation Discovery Travel Grants, uh, in which students can go learn uh, about how to operate a new instrument we have hydroinformatics fellowship grants uh, in which students uh, develop uh, data services apps. Uh, we have community meetings, for example, the Quasi Biennial uh, Conference is coming up in June uh, in uh, Tahoe, California. And so we provide travel grants to students to participate in those meetings and in other meetings. We have, um, let's talk about water grants in which uh, students can host an event on their campus kind of built around water and film. 
So um, students show a film, invite a panel of experts and engage the community in discussions about water. Uh, we recently uh, instituted a Voices of the Future grant in which we invited students uh, with two separate grants, uh, graduate and undergraduate invited students to tell us uh, what their vision of water science uh, was. And so we'll be announcing the winners of those uh, in early December uh, at AGU. Quasi, um, as I said, we have workshops and training courses. One of our premier training courses is the seven week residential program at the National Water Center uh, in Alabama in partnership with the Weather Service. This is an event in which uh, students travel to the National Water Center. Uh, they live there. And they work with scientists, uh, NOAA scientists and scientists from uh, other universities on really intriguing projects around uh, water prediction. And so quasi support, quasi and the Weather Service support all of the costs associated with that. It's a really unique opportunity. Uh, we've had more than 150 students participate in that so far. We also have these training workshops in which students can participate. So for example, we've had workshops on uh, microwave measurement of, of ET, sensor construction and deployment, drones, geophysics, um, our snow school, which we held this year in uh, 2020 at Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Um, of course, we've had to transition to more virtual workshops uh, than uh, we would like, but we've held two or three virtual workshops this year and they've been pretty, pretty successful. Not as, not quite as nice as the hands-on, but, uh, uh, but they've been uh, beneficial. We provide online educational resources. And so this is, um, you know, we were kind of forced into spinning up more things in the last few months than we had in the past. And so we have uh, collected these resources and made them available to commun the community. So there are, for example, more than 200 archived cyber seminars with more than 30,000 views on the Quasi YouTube channel. And we have movies uh, that support the less talk about water activity. We have curated data uh, collections in HydraShare um, and other curated uh, online resources. We have the Quasi Virtual University, which uh, is really a unique um, opportunity. Uh, so uh, so universities participate in that, this. And so if your university participates, then you can, uh, as a student, take courses at other universities while getting credit at your own university. Um, and so this is uh, you know, the quasi virtual university is underway now. Uh, we have uh, participants from University of Wisconsin, University of Washington, Utah State University, uh, and others. Uh, and so it's a really nice way to learn things that aren't uh, taught at your own university. So students enroll in three one month modules and then get a full uh, you know, three course, uh, three hour course credit from that. We also have online um, a lecture, a guest lecture database in which uh, uh, teachers can volunteer to teach a lecture and uh, people can re request a guest lecture. So the URL for that is on your screen. Uh, Kowazi supports data driven education. And so we've contributed a number of modules to the um, uh, Carleton College website. Uh, we also uh, have support the, uh, this thing called HydroLearn uh, in which the, uh, so the Carleton College is more uh, self-taught modules. HydroLearn is modules that teachers can take uh, and use in their classes. Both of these are really nice resources uh, for teachers and I think Anne uh, we'll talk about these a bit, uh, her experience with these a bit more. Uh, uh, Quasi also provides a gateway to online computing. And so um, we, we are standing up this gallery of apps that users uh, can, can use or uh, in teaching or to, 
to learn more about uh, activities. And so we'll have a Python uh, gallery, uh, um, Quasi supports MATLAB online. And so uh, the students and teachers can log in to uh, HydraShare, get to MATLAB online and utilize uh, MATLAB there, uh, especially if your uh, institution doesn't have a, a MATLAB license. We're also standing up some uh, R, uh, an R gallery and shiny apps and so on. And so these can be launched uh, through our data service called uh, HydraShare. And so Quasi supports uh, FAIR data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. So um, our data services, data services are motivated by this principle of, of FAIR data. Uh, and so we have two principal uh, technologies that we use uh, to support the community. One is the uh, hydrologic information system, uh, which is um, oops, which is kind of shown here, and then the the menu is shown down the right side. And so in this system, you know, you can find users can find um, you know what data from 1.1 million locations, 148 billion observations. Uh, and so this is a nice resource for teaching, uh, for research and so on. Then the other technology is HydraShare and HydraShare is, is, a, is a pretty easy system for sharing data, for collaborating, uh, for finding data and so on. And so, um, I have a resource here at the end, which kind of is, you know, seven steps to get started with HydraShare that will help you uh, in that regard. And so here, um, this is for uh, archival really, and for your access uh, late after this uh, webinar, but I provided links to most of the things that we've talked about uh, here today, and certainly am happy to uh, you know, you know, respond to questions and and requests for ad additional information. So, um, thank you again for the opportunity to to talk to uh, to this NAGT webinar. Speak. Uh, we, you know, we're looking forward to stronger collaborations, particularly as Quasi moves into uh, more support of uh, undergraduate education. So, uh, thank you, and. Uh, Yes, so I'll turn it over to Ann, perhaps. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Jared. Um, let me just get my screen sharing going here. So, so Jared gave a fantastic overview of, um, of all of the things that Kawazi does or some of the things that Kawazi does. And what I thought I would do was just give you the perspective of what it's like uh, to be a university faculty member involved in teaching and research um, and thinking through how can Kawazi help, my, help me do my job better. Um, so I am at Kent State University. And just to give you some perspective on um, kind of where I'm coming from. So Kent State is a large university in Ohio. We are the second largest university in Ohio. Um, and I am situated within the geology department where we have, um, depending on how the economy is going, 50 to 130 undergraduates at any given time, about 20 master students and 10 PhD students. Um, our department classes, particularly our water-oriented classes, also serve students from other majors, including geography, environmental studies, and conservation bio. And one thing to note about Kent State is that we don't, we are not a land-grant school, um, so we don't have agriculture or forestry or fisheries and wildlife or engineering, which are often the places that you would find other um, water scientists outside of geology. And so even though I'm situated within this large research university, I feel like I can connect with many of you who are at, might be at smaller schools or undergraduate only schools in that I am kind of one of two hydrologists on campus. And until just a few years ago, it was the only one on campus. Um, and so uh, I've really valued Kawazi in terms of its ability to help me um, 
connect to the larger hydrologic community in my teaching and research. Um, so in terms of research, I currently have two PhD students, one master's student and one undergrad. Those numbers are reasonably typical. And my research focuses on um, urban hydrology and fluvial geomorphology. So just not to talk myself up, right? But to give you some context for, you know, when I talk about how Kawazi services have helped me, you have that kind of background. Um, so Jared mentioned HydroShare, which is a great tool for data discovery. And one of the things that I really, so I teach a watershed hydrology class that is mixed undergrads and grads, dominantly undergrads. Um, and one of the things that I really like to emphasize with them is uh, data analysis and data analysis techniques and data discovery techniques. And so being able to tap into that there's 4,691 data sets um, on HydroShare as of yesterday afternoon. And you can see from the last modified column more every day, right? Um, so being able to uh, utilize those data sets in my teaching has been a fantastic um, a resource for students. Obviously we also use things like USGS National Water Information System and and places like that, but HydroShare gives us access to research data sets. Um, sometimes even ones that you see, you know, you can write a paper and archive your data in HydroShare. And so the students can read the paper and then they can go back and they can look at the data. Um, a recent effort uh, by a group of us using HydroShare was to post our teaching resources for hydrology and water resources related classes. Um, this was in the midst of the transition to online this spring and trying to think about the things that we had that we could share with each other. Um, and so that's turned out to be a really nice resource where you can go in and browse almost complete courses uh, from some people or selected teaching activities. Um, it's not as polished as what you find on CERC or Teach the Earth but it, it was a way to very rapidly get a lot of information out there and make it findable and usable um, for the hydrology education community. Um, as Jared mentioned, we have also collaborated uh, with Teach the Earth. So several years ago, um, Kawazi and I think with some NSF support um, helped faculty develop data-driven hydrology education modules and post them to Teach the Earth. So I just put a screenshot in of the one that I developed at the time. Um, and that has been used by my class ever since. It's great to be able to just send them someplace and, and be able to have them walk through assignments step by step, but it's also used by folks from other universities. Um, and it also is illustrative of the greater synergy that we could have between uh, NAGT activities like Teach the Earth and Kawazi, because although this module is hosted on Teach the Earth, the data are hosted in the Kawazi hydrologic information system. So as part of doing this hydrology activity, my students also get exposed to the Kawazi data services and that method for searching and um, retrieving data as well. Um, Jared also mentioned the Kawazi Virtual University. This is one of my very favorite things. Um, I call this the choose your own adventure, uh, a way of getting graduate advanced topics in hydrology. So students um, have this menu, and this is this year's menu of one month modules up on the screen. Um, and they can choose the two or three that make the most sense for their interests. And then they can learn about those topics from real worldwide experts in the field, right? And these are things that, you know, my hydrogeology colleague and I, we can't teach them all of this. We don't know this. I teach the urban and stormwater hydrology module. But my students this fall took the GIS module, they took the drone module, they took the open channel modeling module, they took mine, they're taking the land lab. I mean, I think we've got six out of the eight modules that the Kent State students are able to take this semester. And so for someone in a graduate serving institution that doesn't have, you know, 10 water scientists on the faculty, 
this resource is incredibly valuable for giving our graduate students a really world-class and diverse education in hydrology. Um, and, and from my perspective, that's fantastic. The other thing that's pretty great is that because students are taking it as a three credit course, but I'm only teaching one month and it's the month right in my exact specialty, right? And so um, it's a really nice way for both students and faculty. And then on the back end, Kawazi has done a great job of supporting the enrollment process, coordinating things across universities, um, maintaining the Canvas learning management system, enabling the web conferencing. And so, you know, you have a, a tech support person behind the scenes, essentially helping make this teaching, multi-university teaching process easier. And again, I think, well, um, Jared listed some of the other universities that are participating, which are sort of big land grant universities. I think the real value of something like the quasi virtual university is for those of us at um, more mid-size or smaller graduate programs um, to really diversify the expertise our students have access to. They also, the, I will say the students are fantastic um, and they love interacting with each other across universities, right? So for example, um, in the module that I just finished teaching on urban hydrology, I had students go out and look at stormwater controls in their neighborhoods or in their towns, wherever they were living. And then I was able to say, okay, now I'm gonna put you in breakout groups and compare how stormwater ponds look in Portland, Oregon and Madison, Wisconsin and Kent, Ohio. And what might we learn from the design standards in these different states and from the climatic and geologic context in these different states to understand where we see similarities and differences. So it's not just um, getting to do expertise across fields, but also that interaction between students coming from different backgrounds and geography that make it such a powerful experience. Um, and I just wanted to kind of, Jared mentioned a bunch of these, but I just wanted to show you how our department has made use of some of these other education resources that Kawazi offers. And I wanted to emphasize that um, even though, as Jared said, right now our institutional membership in Kawazi is limited to graduate only institutions, although hopefully changing, um, access to these resources is not limited to member institutions and undergraduates are also certainly able to participate. Um, so Jared mentioned more than 200 recorded cyber seminars. These are fantastic. So I use them in a couple of different ways. Um, when it's not 2020 and we can have a weekend field trip, um, if a student isn't able to make the field trip, I'm able to say, we'll tap into, you know, pick a certain number of cyber seminars, uh, watch them and write them up. Uh, and they can choose the ones that are most interesting to them. And um, usually they get a lot out of being able to watch these cyber seminars. Um, I also, you know, of course, when they're live, um, I encourage students in our department to attend them. And usually the response I get back after they go to their first one is, what? Why wasn't I going to these before? Um, because they are, there have been both scientific topics and then increasingly as of late, as Jared has mentioned, things that are more professional development related. So um, managing the manuscript submission process, how to network at conferences, things like that, that are applicable to students who aren't just hydrology students, right? Can really serve our broader departmental community. Um, the guest lecture database is something that I took advantage of um, this spring when I was teaching a grad level seminar um, and then in the midst of tra transition to COVID um, to look up because many of the people who've put entries into the guest lecture database have put specific papers associated with their entries. Um, and so I was able to look at an early version of that database and say what papers and topics would be relevant to my graduate seminar and then have the students read the paper and then talk to the author of the paper um, about their paper. And it was a fantastic experience, I think, for both students and um, the faculty members involved in that. Um, the short courses and workshops, I've sent graduate students uh, to those in the past and hope to do so in the future. Um, really super helpful in building research skills. Um, 
especially when it might be something that's kind of new to you as a faculty member. So to be able to get them training on things like that. Um, and then also, again, building connections with students at other universities. Um, the Biennial Colloquium, which is a little off because of 2020, so now scheduled for 2021, is a fantastic several day intimate conference uh, in water science. And um, while most of the attendees are graduate students, postdocs and, and faculty and agency scientists, I have actually brought undergraduates to that conference. The undergraduate I brought uh, there in 2014 was an REU student. Um, and she is now finishing her PhD with one of the speakers she met and networked with at the Biennial Colloquium. Um, so that was really an incredible and transformative experience for her. Um, and all of my graduate students that I brought there have had great experiences as well. Um, it's helped that Kawazi kind of locates these conferences in conference centers that are in beautiful locations, a little bit out of the way. And so you just, you spend a few days just really kind of at like summer camp for hydrologists getting to, to really know the other attendees at the conference, eating meals together, going to talks, going on hikes, things like that. Um, and then finally, the various travel grants and awards um, that Jared mentioned, particularly highlighting the Voices of the Future Award because it did have a separate breakout for undergraduates, um, although undergraduates could apply to the other awards as well. Um, a student in my department working with a faculty member, not me, um, got one of our Pathfinder Awards a few years ago and was able to help support travel to Abisko, Sweden um, to do some work at a, a Arctic wetland site there and which would not have been possible without that Kawazi Award and it adds significantly to the depth of his graduate research. Um, so these are really just fantastic opportunities for um, to make available to your students. Transitioning now to sort of the other part of my job, um, which is research. Um, first of all, I'd say that, you know, the things that Kwasi does to support education and to support students, well, that enriches my research um, and the general well being of my research group. Uh, you know, so students are, are, have well developed professional networks and access to professional development opportunities through Kwasi. That's one less. Thing that I need to feel like I'm solely responsible for. Also, if they get a chance to go to a workshop or attend a cyber seminar and they come away with new skills, of course, we can integrate that as well. Um, other things that Quasi does that helps me with my research is that because they've got those great data management resources with HydroShare and the HIS, um, they've also got some really thoughtful information about how to develop data management plans when you're submitting a proposal. So when you want to submit a proposal that requires a data management plan, you can go on the Quasi website, get even some example language about how you'll archive your data in the Quasi data services. Um, and I've gotten positive comments from reviewers when I've submitted data management plans that talk um, about using Quasi data services. Um, and then Jared kind of already talked about HydroShare. I would just emphasize that it is probably the easiest and most flexible data archive service that I've had experience with um, and is very accepting of lots and lots of different types of data from time series data to spatial data to model um, outputs to even as we showed educational resources. So there's an absolutely a lot that you can do there and you can get a DOI. Um, so that it can be referenced directly in your paper and meet any funding requirements as well. Um, the HIS system is more focused on time series data and as part of developing that system, Kawazi developed some really great metadata standards for time series data. And I've found those standards to be very useful in saying, hey students, you know, before you graduate, before you wrap that project up, let's get all of your data cleaned up and, and get metadata associated with it so that when somebody else pulls it out of the drawer 
in a few years, we'll know exactly what's going on. And we've used the quasi um, standards as a template for that, whether or not we actually get it up on the quasi um, services. Um, they also, if that's seeming a little overwhelming, uh, publishing and data management and metadata and things like that, quasi cyber seminars and other workshops um, and staff support are fantastic in terms of training you how to use their tools effectively. And then finally, um, you know, many of the projects that Jared mentioned and that I've talked about, um, some of those have come out of um, people wanting to do broader impacts with Kawazi support. So oftentimes the virtual workshops or the short courses um, may form broader impacts for someone's grant. Um, some of the cyber seminars series, et cetera. And Kawazi can also, I don't wanna volunteer Jared and his staff for things, but Kawazi, may actually be interested in being a research partner on some of your uh, proposals. And so that's another fantastic way of developing um, a greater depth and breadth of, of skills and, and what you can actually do. Um, just finally, I wanted to hit two other things. There is a AGU session coming up on Tuesday, December 8th on I online hydrology education lessons learned from both designed and impromptu remote instruction. It is um, an e-lightning session. So there will be an hour dedicated to short um, three minute presentations and then you'll be able to browse the interactive posters for, for much longer. There, we have really great presentations um, in this session, um, including one uh, by Ida as well, one of our invited. Uh, presenters. So I'm looking forward to that and I hope that I'll see some of you there. Um, I also wanted to mention that some of the things that have come out um, it, from Quasi and others this year were uh, the result of an NSF rapid grant aimed at increasing infrastructure for distance education and hydrologic science. And so a lot of them, like the guest lecture database and the education resources on HydroShare, we've already just hit as part of what Quasi has to offer. But there's even more being developed now, um, including things like our shiny apps and interactive hydrology lessons. Um, and not all of that has yet been integrated onto the Quasi website, but there's a lot of effort going on with Quasi playing a supporting and background role um, to help us do a better job of this new, for many of us, online teaching environment that we find ourselves in. Um, so with that, I guess I'll pass it back to Ida. Thank you both. Thank you, Anne and Jared. This was so interesting and very, very useful. I cannot, um, in, I mean, every day I'm honestly learning something new about Quasi and it's wonderful. Um, honestly, the, the breadth of information and resources that Quasi provides is absolutely amazing. And that's why we wanted to have this webinar to provide those resources um, to NAGT uh, users as well. Uh, so far, uh, I have uh, a couple of questions. One of them um, is, must the student's institution be a member before he or she uses the quasi services? Maybe Jared, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, so our uh, services, everything we do is open to everybody. Um, for free. Uh, I mean, there's a cost to attend a workshop, but there's a cost to, you know, you know to go to uh, the biennial, but everything is available. Uh, the data are available, the workshops, uh, anyone can enroll, uh, the cyber seminars, anyone can, uh, you know, attend live or view the archives. It's all there. I think the um, there's a one benefit to being a member, and that is, for example, costs uh, to attend a workshop are a bit lower for members uh, than non-members. Usually, it's fifty or a hundred dollars uh, discount for members. But every, I mean, all the code is open source on GitHub, um, so yeah, it's all there for uh, the whole world. But you should convince your institution to become a member anyways, <laughs> if you're eligible now or if and when we expand to undergraduate only because then you have votes and voices in the direction that Kawazi goes. Um, and, you know, 
the annual membership. And, and Go ahead. Because the next question that I have. Sorry. Go on, Anne, sorry. Oh, um, sorry, we seem to have a technical hiccup there. Um, I would say, you know, if I look at what my institution pays for membership in a given year, those discounts that Jared just talked about, as well as the vote, I mean, we definitely get our money back um, from Kawazi in, a, in an average year. So um, if you can convince your administrators, you should become a member. Yeah, it, it's $200. The, the annual fee is $200. So, I mean, that's less than, um, you know, membership for one person in most professional organizations. Um, so thank you both. And yeah, that was another one of the questions, like what does it take to get institutions to be members? So both of you, both Anne and Jared actually addressed that. And I don't know if you wanna add anything more to, to that in becoming an institutional member of Quasi. So there's a, there's a letter template on our website under uh, members. And it's a, essentially if, if an institution wants to become a new member, then they, uh, the letter has to be signed by someone at a, at a dean's level, more or less, saying we want to be a member. And then they need to name up to three member representatives. So, for example, Anne is a representative uh, for Kent State. So that's kind, of, and then that's kind of it, and then pay the fees. Yeah. We have another question about students who are based outside of the U.S. Can you both provide some feedback on how those students can get involved with Quasi or use resources from Quasi? So. Um, when I say everybody, <laughs> I mean everybody. So, um, for example, you know, I have a call tomorrow um, with the World Bank in Switzerland and with some colleagues in Ethiopia about using quasi services for the Nile River Basin. Um, HydraShare has been uh, utilized in the Mekong River Basin. They call it Mekong Water, but it's really HydraShare with a different front page on it. Uh, we have um, international members of Kawazi. They're affiliate members, um, but they are still members. Um, we have uh, international um, scientists, students, and faculty participate in Kawazi events. You know, there's a little bit of uh, um, uh, limitations on how we can spend federal dollars uh, to support international activities. So for example, I don't think we could give a Pathfinder grant to a student uh, from you know, Germany uh, to, to travel to do research. But otherwise, um, it, you know, we, we welcome uh, participation from the broader community. Yeah, and, and international students at U.S. institutions have full access to things like the Pathfinder fellowships. Um, Thank you. So there's a question um, that is posted on chat. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so there's a question about the virtual university and where students are eligible to participate. Um, so you do need to have a faculty member from your university teaching a module and the virtual university that year in order to be able to enroll in the virtual university modules. Um, and the reason for that is that um, you don't pay tuition to any university except your home university. Um, and so if it's all sort of an equal trade in terms of faculty and students going in, in different directions, then there's no money that has to be passed around universities and, and university administrations are um, pretty comfortable with it. But if we started letting students who were 
not at a university where there was a faculty member teaching a module um, learn from us. Like if I were teaching students at 20 different universities and Kent State students couldn't go there um, and take the equivalent, then my university would start to have a problem with it. So it is limited. Um, the application period for 2021 um, virtual university module instructors is closing in <laughs> early next week, mid next week, I have to write my application, but it is open right now. Um, and it's the only fall semester or fall quarter. We have both quarter system and semester system uh, universities participating, but you do need some lead time in terms of instructors applying and, and writing a couple hundred words about what they'd like to teach the following fall. Well, thank you, and for that clarification. Um, and again, all other questions are welcome. I am uh, slowly switching to presenting the results of our survey. Um, so along with my uh, colleague, Bridget Mulvey, also from Kent State, we ran a survey before these webinar series to understand the needs of faculty um, in using resources from both NAGT and Quasi. So you can see the results of our survey here, where um, when we asked to describe the barriers to using existing resources, time and awareness and access to those resources were the main um, components or made the main responses. And the barriers in submitting course material to HydroShare or other quasi projects are mainly addressed as lack of knowledge or awareness of this, these resources. So hopefully after the wonderful presentations that Anne and Jared provided, uh, we have addressed this. And now many of you are able to share your, not only your data, but also your course material and activities and um, anything else that fits within the structure of the projects of HydroShare um, on HydroShare um, uh, projects. Uh, we're going to have a little bit more discussion on how time is a barrier and ask you for feedback on that. But uh, another part of our survey was asking uh, participants on resources or incentives that they would need to be able to work with uh, faculty in other disciplines to create inclusive multidisciplinary course material or activities for hydro related courses. And you can see the responses here, uh, needs for teaching assistance for an organized system like the platform that HydroShare provides. Uh, funds and credits and incentives, time again, um, and some other um, options such as projects and ideas and data, which now you learn that there is a ton of data available to anybody on HydroShare uh, or overall quasi resources that they can use for producing uh, course related material. So Based on these graphs, which I'm going to um, move a little bit slower off of this, we would like to invite you to smaller working groups to talk to each other and provide us some feedback on first, how can NAGT and Quasi combine their forces to help you use the resources that the organizations provide. As I told you, this webinar was the second in our NAGT Quasi joint webinar series. And in the previous webinar, we discussed the resources that NAGT provides in the context of Teach the Earth and other resources. And what can we do to help with the time barrier? We know that we can't necessarily produce time for you, but maybe uh, the organizations can help with um, some other way to provide that time. Uh, and we want you to um, help us in, in, finding, in finding that. And more information on the incentives that you might need to um, contribute to these resources and use these resources. So I'm gonna actually stop sharing this, but I will provide the link to this um, short presentation on uh, the chat. So anybody can actually, uh, that are in the uh, working groups, uh, sorry, in the small uh, groups can actually use this to come up with um, ideas and answers to the questions and share with us uh, within the next five minutes. 
So pretty soon you should be getting invitations to the small groups. You should get some sort of pop-up message uh, inviting you to a breakout room. Uh, and if you're having trouble with that or don't see it, uh, feel free to let me know and I'll help you get there. to get get away from that uh and i've read your blog um quite a bit and putting some things together <laughs> well i'm glad it was useful i was just going to say those hydro share education resources um collection and maybe jared or i can google that up for you real quick yes thank um, you very much for that that blog <laughs> they, i've just um, uh, in fact i've just included posts and in, uh, as assignments go read this <laughs> i mean that's how i mean some of them were written specifically for that purpose basically like i could spend a bunch of time going through method stuff in lecture but i'm just going to write it and embed the videos in it and then you know expect you to do So right when we started the uh, breakout rooms, a bunch of people decided to. Yeah, I noticed that. So, yeah, do you want to give them a, a note to return, like within a minute? Yeah. Because there isn't, honestly, there isn't much happening in there either. <laughs> but I think I still think um, if we had done breakout rooms in the in the quasi one, it would have been we would have gotten more feedback than we did. We did. So this this worked better.
I don't think people don't like breakout rooms this much. It kind of, I don't know. Sometimes we do this in webinars and have really good discussions. And then other times we do it and people aren't into it. So it kind of depends on the day, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's been great so far, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for arranging it and making making it so organized. This is wonderful. Yeah, no problem. All right, I just hit the uh, close room button, so everyone should start and probably make their way back soon. In the next minute okay. or so. Did you have? Um, comments you were going to make to close up that discussion? Um, I just wanted to let the people that are in the breakout rooms uh, provide feedback from the breakout rooms, but okay. I don't have anything else to add. Yeah, Because okay. having the breakout rooms and not being able to share what happened in the breakout room is, mm -hmm. is not good. So we just want them to share and yeah, Bridget, I'm because in the, in the breakout, breakout room that I was with Bridget, she was getting people to respond to her. So that was great. Yeah, hopefully she'll have something. Wow, they are using them until the last minute on their <laughs> radar. That's good. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. I hope that some good conversation happened in the breakout rooms. We have just a few minutes. I'm sorry to rush you out of your breakout rooms, but I wanted you guys to share what, what you discussed in the breakout rooms with everyone else so we can um, get a better idea as a group on what the next um, steps are. If anybody wants to volunteer, maybe Bridget, do you want to provide some feedback from your um, breakout group? Sure. Um, so we talked about the need for um, easy to use searches. And so um, the people in the group were excited to learn about quasi resources, but weren't sure what was available in terms of searchability. Um, and so they were hoping that either now or in the future, that the resources would be easy to search across many different things, including um, identifying the level of the activity. So is this an intro activity um, or beyond? Um, how much time it would require? Um, if labeled online, what part is online? Is it just an online data set? Um, are there interactions with students online? Is there a required field component? um and others such like the more they could figure out quickly whether a resource would be likely to work for them the more likely they would be to keep looking um and kind of shorten that process of identifying resources that would help um and they also asked for um really clear instructions on how to use the resources um in really simple ways again i think the more straightforward and easier to search and to understand what um what might help, uh, I think, with people use of the resources. Yep, very, very reasonable. Yep. Um, any uh, feedback from the other uh, working groups? And I don't know if you have any feedback from your working group. Um, well, Jared and I were in the same working group and we had a great conversation with Eric Burtis about the challenges of getting started in teaching a new class, um, especially when it's not in your field. And so it seems like that's another area where kind of piggybacking on what Bridget was just saying, um, both organizations could maybe do better like a, a start here if you're teaching for the first time. Um, you know, these are the these are the resources you need to just make it through the first semester. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Um, so we still have just a little bit. Um, um, well, no, we don't actually have any time, but we're, we're open if any of the participants have any feedback that they want to share, either in the chat or just unmute yourselves before we wrap up the webinar. And if there is nothing, I would like to thank everybody for being here, especially our presenters and Mitchell for uh, doing an amazing job. And um, yeah, if anybody else has any closing remarks, 
um, please feel free to say. Yeah, I'd also like to say thank you to everyone, um, to our presenters and everyone who has joined us for the webinar today. And just let you know that we have more webinars coming up, including this one uh, next week on looking at Earth and Space Science instructional materials. So we invite you to join us. If you've got an extra minute or two, we always appreciate if you can let us know how the webinar was. And I put a link to the webinar evaluation in the chat box. And you'll be able to find resources from today's webinar, um, as well as past webinars um, through the event page for today and our webinar archive. So again, thank you all for attending, and we hope to see you at a future at a future webinar. Bye. Thank you all. All right. Very good. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, 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 Mitchell. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks, everybody. I'll send an email to thanks to thank everybody. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I I loved being part of it. I needed to know some more.